episode two of Low Poly Hand Paint, or like some would like to say, Low Hand Poly Paint. This week, we're gonna be making a pinball machine, woo! -hoo! Last week, we made this uh, wonderful chest, and this time around, I wanted to do a little bit more challenging stuff, so I was gonna try a pinball machine. Took forever to do, but in this video, I'm gonna go through how I modeled it, how I UV unwrapped it, and also all the texture painting steps that I had to go through. So get settled in, and let's get started. Like always, I start with the default cube. I searched for pinball machine dimension and in edit mode, I roughly scaled and placed the main body of the machine. If you've seen any of my 100 episodes of the 10 minute modeling challenge, this is modeled exactly like that. E to extrude, S to scale, Control R for loop cuts. I to inset the inner body and E to extrude the inside of the machine. I'm using my Wacom Intuos Pro Medium tablet that I haven't touched since the last chest video that I made. To create the leg, a face was duplicated with Shift D and extruded. Same with the scoreboard, duplicating a face with Shift D and extruding it upwards. I add minor details as separate geometry like the ball launcher. To get the cylinder of the launcher, I duplicate a quad face, right click to subdivide, and then with the loop tools add on, you have this handy circle feature to make it round. That's how I create the launcher. The interior was modeled by duplicating a face inside the machine, followed by extrude and spin operations. A quick tip to spin is to select a vertex on the corner, press E to extrude the vertex and drag it on an axis arrow. Press Shift S and select Cursor to Selected to place the 3D cursor there. Delete the vertex, you don't need that anymore. Now you have the 3D cursor ready for the spin tool to create a nice arc. Hold Ctrl down to snap the spin tool. The rest of the interior of the pinball machine is a matter of duplicating and extruding vertices and edges from a top-down 2D view. This is just going to be a visual asset, so I didn't pay any attention to whether or not it would work to play this game. I'm not even sure if the ball would pass through some of these areas. Pinball machines are sloped, so gravity can pull down the ball towards the flippers, but I decided to model everything flat first. This makes it easier to have a top-down view for the entire layout work rather than trying to do it on an angle. And then I model one of the flippers in the same way. To get the other flipper, I select the first one and I press Shift D to duplicate the faces. Then I press S to scale and type in X minus one to flip the geometry. I model some targets to hit with the ball like simple quads. Once the interior shapes are done, I select all of them and press S to scale and then type in Z zero. This way it flattens everything to make sure I don't have any stray vertices in the vertical plane. E to extrude the entire interior followed by Shift N if any of the faces have inverted normals. To model the metal ramp, I duplicate a quad face from the machine. I use subdivide and then loop tools circle add-on to make it round. You could have just created a circle shape instead. This is just my low poly habit. I duplicate it to make three circles and I extrude them up a bit. I duplicate some of the faces again and then I extrude them along their normals to get some sort of a support. To connect the separate geometry, select two faces, right click and select bridge faces. I click Shift A and add a Bezier curve that I can't really say the name of. This will act as the path for the ramp to follow. Separate the ramp geometry to a new object. The array modifier is added and the relative offset is changed from the X axis to the vertical Z axis. Instead of a fixed count, I change the fit type to fit curve and then I select the Bezier curve. Now we also have to add the Curve modifier and select the Curve object to be the Bezier curve. The Deform axis is changed to Z as well to make the ramp follow the curve. Select the curve and tab into edit mode. You can now move the curve control points with G and rotate them with R, or select the handles and move those with G. If you want to twist the control point to lean the ramp over, you can't do that with R. You have to press Ctrl T for Torque to twist it. I only added one ramp to this pinball machine. Personally, I don't like overly complex pinball machines. Since I don't play them often, I like them to be simple so I can quickly learn how to get a good score. So I'm just making one ramp here. I add the flipper buttons, some start and coin release buttons, and I inset and extrude the display and scoreboard. I'll be using identical legs, so I copy the first one and flip them around to place them in each corner. When I'm done with the interior, I select the vertices and rotate them to get the tilt. Last week, I did an old chest and I like the stylized, cartoony, dented look. 
so I'm going to destroy these perfect lines by selecting vertices and edges and moving them around. I use Ctrl R to add some loop cuts so I can deform the machine further. I bevel some of the corner vertices with Ctrl Shift B and I bevel some edges with Ctrl B. After I bevel, I usually slide the vertices along the edge by pressing G twice to make some longer triangles. That's it. The modeling part is done. Let's move on to the UV unwrapping. Last week, I only used the quick Smart UV Project feature with a default angle and a margin of 0.03. This time, I wanted to have better efficiency of the UVs, but not a lot of geometry can be mirrored on this pinball machine, so overlapping UVs would be very limited. I still think manually adding seams to everything is tedious and slow, and I will get to that point, but I'm still cutting some corners here to save some time. I remember a few years ago, I bought a Blender add-on called UV Packmaster. I rarely buy add-ons because I tend to want to do everything with a default installation so people can follow along, but I'm making an exception for UV packing. Blender is great at many things, but not at UV packing to save texture space. My version of UV Packmaster was old and version 3 now exists. Luckily enough, they offered an upgrade discount, so I emailed them to get a discount code and I upgraded for about $15 or $20. The original price is $39 plus VAT for a single license but I have to say it's worth every penny. I'm not sponsored by them, but I am impressed by the heuristic combined CPU and GPU packing algorithm, and it did a great job to pack the UVs. Last week, with the chest, we spoke about the importance of having margins and bleeding of pixels outside the UV islands to avoid seams, especially during MIP mapping. This add-on has a great feature where you can type in the margin needed in pixels. I'm going for a 2048 by 2048 pixel texture this time, and for that, you need a whopping 16 pixels of bleeding, so the margin set in UV Packmaster is double that, 32 pixels. Don't forget to set the bleed to 16 pixels under options for the brush later on. I decided to overlap some of the UVs for the legs, the three cylindrical bumpers, and the top and bottom sides of some of the interiors. Again, UV Packmaster has a good feature for this where you can change the main mode to aligning tools. You can select similar UV islands and click Align Similar Stack to overlay the UV islands. Back in the single tile packing mode, you can click on Lock Overlapping to make the add-on keep this overlap as it packs the UV islands. I also enable the flashy heuristic search and advanced heuristic to let the algorithm pack the UVs better. I had to repeat this process a bunch of times. I ended up deciding to delete the hidden underfaces of the interior since they will never be visible and some of the meshes I added manual seams to and unwrapped them manually to avoid too many small scattered faces to overlay the UVs for the four legs and the three cylindrical bumpers. The main graphics of this pinball machine will be the interior artwork, so I scaled that UV island up. I did the same for the display faces, as I imagined I wanted to paint some more intricate details there. I think you should be careful using two big differences in scale in the same object, as it could look a bit odd, but I wanted to give it a try. Finally, after many attempts and figuring out how I wanted to pack things, I found a decent compromise between effort and result. Now it's time to start the texture painting. In the texture paint panel, I start by creating a new material for the pinball machine. I click on the base color and change that to image texture. Click on new to create a new texture. Give the texture a name and set the resolution. I'm going for 2048 by 2048 pixels this time for some more detail. I don't need alpha, so I'll untick that, and then I change the base color to gray. In the left window, I change to the new texture and I save it straight away. Remember, Blender does not do that automatically, so save it often. I also disable specular in the viewport to reduce some of the shiny surfaces when I paint. Then I go to brush properties and I create a new palette. Set the colors that you plan to use and click the little plus icon to add them. I will need some grays, some blues, black, and then for that old 80s feel, I'm adding some cyan and magenta. At this point, I'm deciding I'm going to attempt to paint a space shuttle themed pinball machine, so I add some orange colors for the flames too. To simplify masking, I prepare by going to the vertex properties and I select faces and assign them to new vertex groups. This way, I can come back here and select these vertex groups to quickly select the main artwork, the display, the legs, the body of the machine, and so forth. I select the body vertex group and I toggle into texture painting mode with tab. I pick a mid-tone blue color and use the paint tool to fill the body. I do the same for the upper exterior part. Using the same method, I color the little tile targets 
and bumpers white. The square buttons and the round flipper buttons get a nice red colour. First I decided to try something new. I created a new mesh that I shaped into the space shuttle. I was thinking I could use this as a spray mask and let the occlude feature block the paint. But I found two problems with this. First of all, it does not anti-alize the occluded edges, which would be kind of cool if Blender added in the future. But secondly, it started to bleed through the occluding mesh for some reason, but maybe that was due to the UVs of the mask not being properly set, so maybe that could be worked around if I were to map that properly. Anyway, I scrapped the masking idea and I decided to go free painting. After all, I need the practice. I can't draw straight lines yet. I masked the main board, or whatever it's called, to begin painting. Remember, when you mask, you need to tick this little obscure icon at the top for masking to work. Only selected faces in edit mode will receive paint when this is enabled. You can also shift left click faces in the texture paint mode to toggle masking of individual faces, which works great on low poly objects. I use F to change the brush size and shift F to change the opacity. Using the pen, I manually tried to create some gradients going from a sun setting retro magenta color to blue to dark blue for space. I did an image search on Google for Space Shuttle, and on my other monitor, I kept this image open so I could look at it. I'm pretty sure I won't get into any troubles for copyright, because I can't really copy what I see, but I'm trying my best. I'm going with a pink brush to do the smoke clouds from the shuttle launch. I use the Add Blend mode and bright colors to try to paint some of the highlights of the clouds. At this point, I'm clinging on to the most important discovery in the history of texture painting. Allow it to look horrible. Don't go for details straight away. Use lower opacity and sketch in areas. From a distance, and with plenty of corrected layers, it'll look better later on. I change to a dark color and set the blend mode to multiply, and I add some darker regions at the bottom with a larger brush. This time, I'll try the smear brush to smoothen out the lines of the smoke, or clouds, or whatever these fluffy pink things are. I prefer not to use the smear brush for the wood in the last video, but I think it works pretty well here. Last week, I sort of whined about Blender not having layers like Photoshop or 3D Coat, and in the comment section, Lithium534 commented that you can use the RGB nodes to blend different images together in the material. I replied that was smart, and Alex Leonard Crea agreed that that is smart. I decided to give that a go and created a new texture, this time with an alpha channel, and I set this as a mix node to combine the two textures. I was thinking it would be safer to add my space shuttle as I would otherwise be painting over the background from which there would be no turning back. I enabled symmetry in the x-axis, first of all because I love symmetry, but also because I would never be able to paint both sides of the shuttle even remotely similar to one another. Looking at the space shuttle image on my other screen, I started to try to paint what I saw. I was pretty happy until uh, I was going to go for the black paint, and it seems like I got the node mixing wrong, so it was just adding it instead of... Uh, mixing it the way I wanted. And then I realized I would need to bake these maps together at the end to get the final image texture. So at this point, I decided to bite the bullet and risk it all to paint on a single texture. Sometimes constraints are good. I found that in the 10 minute modeling challenge. Accept the constraints and push on. So what if I paint over something and regret it? I can fix it and make it better faster than I could manage or debate which layers I should have. So I go back to a single texture, and with symmetry on the x-axis enabled and a brush with a sharper falloff, I begin to paint the main body of the shuttle and the massive red tank. Symmetry will save me. I add the two boosters and switch to a dark color to add the window, the nose cone and the black lines for some panel work. I mainly use mixed blend mode, but I switch at times to multiply to darken some of the regions. I found that I can draw horizontal lines on my tablet much straighter than vertical lines, so if I press 7 on the numpad in top view and hold the ALT key as I rotate the axis icon at the top, I can rotate the viewport while still being in top view. Now I can paint semi-straight lines from left to right, even if they are vertical on the texture. I stay in symmetry mode as long as I can to add some fins, engines and the boosters. Finally, I have to disable symmetry to do some shading work and I use the multiply brush to add shading on one of the side of the shuttle, the main tank and the boosters. I switch to a yellow color and I begin to paint the flames from the engines. I begin in mix blend mode and toggle to add blend mode with a brighter color. This pinball machine will be viewed from a distance so I don't care too much about the edges not being sharp or defined. Time to move on. I thought about what else to add and sometimes shuttles, unfortunately, blow up. I thought that could be a feature in this pinball game, so I began to paint some fire trails from a launch failure. I switched between different blend modes, like mix, add, overlay and multiply with yellows, oranges and black to create fireballs shooting up towards the targets that you can hit with a ball. 
I thought my texture looked dull in the viewport compared to the texture view and I remembered something Grant Abbott said in one of his videos. Enable the Node Wrangler plugin which comes default with Blender and while you hover over the color node in the texture you can press Control shift left click to create a viewer node in the shader editor. With the viewer node hooked up I could now see the texture provided that you press Z and change to material preview. After the fireballs, I attempt to paint a moon at the top of the image. I did another Google image search to find a moon and shaded it kind of similar. And then with a small brush, in the add blend mode I added some stars. For no other reasons than lack of ideas, I began to paint curvature wear on the inner parts of the machine. It makes no sense that those edges would get worn, but since I've gone for the wonky hand painted look, I'm going to paint edge wear. I do this manually with a brush on all the pointy edges of the interior. Use F to resize the brush and Shift F to lower the opacity. With a bright color and the blend mode as screen or add, you go over all the edges. When I do this, I use the vertex group to select the interior groups. With masking enabled, I don't risk damaging any of the other texture areas. From a top view, I add some diagonal bright and dark lines to see if that looks okay, and I leave it like that. Now it's time for my manual ambient occlusion pass. I switch to a darker color, a larger, softer brush with lower opacity. Remember, Shift F changes the opacity, and you go over all the inner edges. This time, I use less masking as I want to hit the interior, the bottom artboard, and the blue exterior at the same time. I go over all the inner edges like this. It doesn't have to be perfect. It'll look okay from a distance. If you are a daredevil, you can disable occlude under options. This way, you don't get that little bright line where the two faces meet. But be warned, you will forget to enable these and you risk making some serious damage to your texture. But the risk is worth the reward, you don't want those bright lines there. Use masking, occlude and fall off settings to paint all the ambient occlusion areas. I prefer to paint rather than bake this to get the hand painted look. Well, this is my second object, but I still prefer it. <laughs> You can also tab into edit mode, select faces and press H to hide the faces. Tab back into edit mode and press Alt H to unhide the faces again. For the bumpers, I shade them dark in the center. I have overlaid the UVs of the three bumpers, so when I paint one of them, the others would automatically receive the texture. I tried to paint some lines where I imagine the ball would most often move to simulate some sort of wear. This could probably be done much better. I changed the stroke method for the brush to line and create some panels for the interior parts. I tried to paint something like an air vent and rivets too. For the exterior, I used the same method as before to add bright edge wear. With a dark brush and high opacity in the mix blend mode, I paint some paint peeling areas. I paint them around the bottom edge of the machine on all sides. I also do the same effect around the buttons where the players would hold their hands. Probably not very realistic wear pattern, but it'll all be okay under the flag of stylized art. Using a smaller brush size with a brighter color in the overlay blend mode, I go around all the edges of the paint peeling to define those edges. Another ambient occlusion pass for the exterior, nothing new here, large paint brushes in multiply blend mode and go over where less light would naturally hit the machine. I only need to mask one of the legs when I paint them since all four legs are using the same UV space. I do simple edge wear and I shade the legs darker towards the bottom. It feels amazing when UV space is overlapped, so you can do all four legs at once. On the backside, I paint a primitive vent using brushes and lines. I add some fake lighting around the edges. For the inner tile targets, or whatever they're called, I color them in groups. Red, green and blue. I free paint some stars on the red targets. I could have done this in Photoshop uh, using nice, perfect star shapes, but in for a penny, in for a pound, I'm going all in hand painted here. For the green targets, I'm going for some launch sequence. Three, two, one, launch. Makes sense, doesn't it? The blue targets they get no decorations, but I paint some orange triangles pointing at them. I want to add some emission on the machine so these areas light up. I outline the triangles with a dark color to make them stand out a bit. There were two blue pads and I'm thinking they could represent the boosters. I need to inform the player about that, so let's write boosters here. Again, why not do this freehand instead of using a font and the text tool? Maybe the fireballs from the exploding shuttle are due to poor launch preparations. For the scoreboard, I paint in a few orange zeros, and for the display I could have tried something more imaginative, but painting the shuttle and the machine took about 3 or 4 hours, and it's 4am now, so I'm going to try to free paint Saturn. It's tricky to do nice ovals on the tablet, and it's probably impossible to do it with a mouse, but I try with different blend modes and brushes to get the planet and its rings in place. 
I used an HDRI image from polyhaven.com to light the image and remember to disable the viewer node in the shader editor. I was wondering for some time why the light didn't work and that was the reason why. I also added some more lighting effects on the main board, some nice triangles going up the ball path, some score indicators for the bumpers, the orbit text and chevrons at the top, which I thought suited when the ball was going around the top, and a black hole at the very top. To get emission working, I saved the texture and brought it into Photoshop. Using the nifty object selection tool, I could mark regions around the UV areas that I wanted to light up, and I copied them into a separate layer. I darkened the base layer and made bright regions strong to use as emission. In the shader editor for the material, I imported the emissive texture and I plugged it into the emission node, setting the emission strength to 20. Initially, I thought it was lighting everything a little bit too much, so I added a multiply node to multiply the emissive texture with itself to make darker regions darker. The glass is just a copy of the baseboard separated into its own layer with a new material that has some transparency, high metallic and low roughness values. I also made a very reflective material for the ramp. The glass and ramp don't require any UV mapping since they're just using plain colors. Finally, I rendered this pinball machine with cycles and I let the emissive areas light up the interior. It would be fun to animate the lights, but I'm happy with the way the machine turned out. It took about five hours to model UV unwrap and texture paint, so if you need a lot of assets, it may not be fast enough if you're on your own. I'm still learning the UV unwrapping and painting, so maybe I can speed it up. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed this episode. That was a lot of fun to make. I learned a tremendous amount doing this thing, and it took forever, but it was worth it, I think. I'm, uh, see what I can come up with next week. I'm going to be uploading this uh, model and the texture to my Patreon site, so from the tutorial tier and up, we'll be able to download that one. And like last week, I'll probably upload a longer version of this as well. I recorded all the screen capturing, but I didn't voice over it because it was five hours. But I could uh, probably compress that one and upload it if you want that. So thanks again to my patrons. Thanks to everyone who's watching my YouTube channel. And thanks for subscribing. Until next week, have a great one and I'll see you then. Bye for now.